I'm really happy to uh, welcome Bob, Bob Brooks here on our channel. Uh, Bob has been a very good friend and also a martial arts instructor I have known for quite a number of years. We taught together in uh, different events uh, back then. And let us just, uh, let me just uh, welcome Bob. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Hi, hi, Manasha. It's good to catch up again and uh, have a chance to talk about the thing we love the most, which <laughs> is martial arts. Um, so it's been a, it's been an interesting year with yes. not a lot of martial arts, uh, but <laughs> a lot of online time talking about martial arts. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you know. Um, Bob, could you please introduce yourself to our viewers, to our members, who you are, what you teach, and when and what with what kind of martial arts you started? Just tell us about yourself, please. I'd be delighted to. Um, I'm very honoured uh, to be here. Um, my name is uh, Rob Robert Bob Brooks. Uh, depending on where I'm teaching, I get called various things, some of them unpleasant. Um, so I teach historical European martial arts, focusing predominantly on late 14th and 15th century fencing from the German-speaking and Italian-speaking parts of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so we look at manuscripts from a range uh, dating from around 1389 to 1494, uh, to keep them as contemporaneous as possible, uh, and also from uh, specific geographic regions, so we have a, a good idea of the common types of martial arts being used at that point. And we predominantly focus on um, a corpus of arms which would be common to um, uh, an, the everyday fighting man uh, right the way up to um, the um, the aristocratic classes, for example, the knights uh, and the, 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 the more professional soldiery of the time. Uh, we do, however, look quite heavily at uh, particular peasant art of fencing, which in fact uh, has long since been my favourite area of focus because it teaches us more about the society in which these martial arts exist. So my background is um, I grew up in the northeast of England, in Northumberland, which is one of England's two border counties with Scotland. Uh, has certainly the longest um, border uh, uh, between the two countries is in my county. And consequently, we had somewhere around about 600 years of continual warfare, uh, to the extent that the population of my region is still uh, is still affected. It, in, uh, my region was effectively depopulated during this time and never recovered. Uh, well, and so just a have, second, please. Just a second. For our viewers, because for your information, we have viewers from all around the world, but... 80, 80 percent of our viewers come from the United States of America. So okay. for our American colleagues, for some reasons we don't know, but 80 percent. For our American viewers, which, which are the majority of this channel, could you please explain uh, that you are English and you are not Scottish? Because they are going to mix I am, up. yes. Please, right. It, it's, it, it, can be, it can be explained that way. Uh, it's slightly more complex when you begin to look at the history. And above every, anything, as well as a martial artist, I am predominantly a, an historian. Um, so Northumberland is unusual in, in respects that it was one of the four Anglo-Saxon kingdoms um, uh, prior to the Norman invasion in 1066. Uh, and uh, the Northumbrians, we had the Viking and we had the Viking raids on the coast here. We are now uh, we are now um, politically on the south side of the border. Uh, the border at one point ranged right the way up to Edinburgh. Uh, it's changed dramatically. We, technically, we are on the English side. Uh, the Kingdom of Northumbria uh, stretched way up into Scotland at, at some points in its history. Um, but the yeah, So we often say that we're not quite English and not quite Scottish. We're sort of a hybrid mix. Um, and when you look at, the, especially if, you, if your viewers would be, would be interested in looking at the, uh, the history of the border reavers and the and 16th century um, border warfare and life here, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, cross 
traffic uh, between England and Scotland in terms of uh, in terms of the alliances, despite the national identities. Uh, so we're we're kind of in a no man's land here. Um, so the north is the Northumberland, northeast coast of England. Newcastle upon Tyne is our regional centre, um, and we're about I, I personally am about thirty miles north of Newcastle upon Tyne, and thirty miles south of the Scottish border, uh, and about ninety miles south of Edinburgh. So you you can you can look at a map and get a rough geographic idea. But yeah, and that the, and and it would probably be good at this point to explain that this is why I have such a heavy accent. Um, because my accent, uh, the, the Northumbrian accent, is the oldest surviving Anglo-Saxon dialect uh, and accent in existence, uh, about 1600 years. Um, so we uh, we still have a very old, uh, very Norse uh, Germanic sounding um, uh, dialect, which uh, leads to long long vowels, lots of a, e, i, o, u's. Um, but I'll, I'll, like in I'll, German, right? <laughs> it is. Uh, we really should have umlauts, to be perfectly honest. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, keep as slow and as clear as possible. Um, my own personal background: I'm half German. My mother was from uh, Lower Saxony, from a uh, small town called Yeva, uh, um, uh, just to the west of Bremen. Uh, my father was uh, Anglo-Irish. Uh, my history, my, my background in terms of fencing, I began sport fencing in uh, around about 1987. Uh, I was about 15 years old. I was never really good at very good at any sports and discovered sport fencing. I had dabbled with some martial arts, uh, some karate and some kickboxing, uh, but I became fairly good at fencing. Um, and consequently, I was studying um, for a, a postgraduate study in uh, to become a journalist, uh, a, a career that I, I was in, in for 20 years before I became a full-time historical fencing teacher uh, back in 20, 2013. Um, but I was studying uh, for my professional qualifications at Edinburgh uh, in 1994 and met, uh, I joined the university fencing team and met a few guys uh, at the fencing team who were interested in looking at historical methods of fencing to see whether we could improve our uh, sport game. And this in itself actually led us to completely abandon Olympic fencing uh, and to focus entirely on um, seeking out uh, um, uh, translating, trans transcribing, translating, and understanding um, historical fighting manuscripts. And at the time when we began this, there maybe were less than half a dozen groups around the world who were involved in this at this point. It was very embryonic. But certainly over the following few years, um, and driven certainly from our perspective, driven a lot by the influx of foreign students to the Edinburgh universities, who would then go back to their own home countries and continue to study under their own steam. Uh, we saw the emergence of what was originally called the Western martial arts community. Uh, and this also tied in with things that were being done in terms of reenactment and living history. Uh, and I think it was around about 1999, 2000, um, Matt Easton, and there is no argument, there has been an argument about who coined the term, Matt Easton coined the term HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. Um, and it was, so from between 94 and, two, and from 1994 to 2003, I was very much on a personal journey to understand the manuscripts and to, uh, and to understand not only what they showed and, and, and how it worked, but also why the manuscripts showed what they showed uh, and why certain things were chosen to be included and why certain things were omitted. Uh, and I set up my school, the Hotspur School of Defence, in on May the 20th, 2003. Uh, so we've been now running for... Uh, nearly 18 years. Um, we also had, we'd also been involved in the foundation of the British Federation for Historical Swordplay, which was the world's 
first truly national umbrella group uh, for the coordination of uh, like-minded groups to help assist with study, to cross-pollinate ideas with. Um, and so that was really my beginning, but the foundation of it was growing up in an area, a, a part of England, um, really, which has seen such a huge um, amount of human history that is still visible, uh, dating right back to the Bronze Age. We still have a, a fairly um, untouched Bronze Age landscapes, um, especially in the upland areas of my county. Um, and that, that in itself led to a project that I've, I've recently been involved in. But, but certainly from, the, from that perspective, um, the history side of things has always been foremost for me. Uh, because it, I always say that the importance of history is that we are the sum total of everything that's gone before us. And it's important for our identity is, as, as human beings, not, as, um, not in terms of political identity or even national identity, but our identity as human beings. Uh, it comes from history and an understanding of history, and we can understand, uh, we can understand the journey which has led to us being here. Um, and for me, certainly, that, uh, that's that been a big driving factor, is to understand the people of the past rather than simply look at artifacts and, 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 uh, and you know, and admire them. Uh, it's more about the human journey, really, about the, about the, the, the human processes that have, that have gone into creating a weapon or a manuscript or a methodology, uh, because these are all very much human processes that, you know, can, 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 can involve a whole lifetime. In fact, can often involve more than a lifetime. And we're very lucky where we are now, certainly in the beginning of the second decade of the 21st century, in the digi in, in the, at the height of the, the digital age as, it, as, it, as, it, as, it's, as it's happened, um, where we can now access uh, pretty much uh, 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 the widest knowledge base we've ever had access to. Uh, and this has been a this has been a, a, a quantum leap in terms of historical research. Um, there is the other side that I, I really enjoy the physicality of martial arts. I enjoy, uh, but I enjoy the I enjoy as an instructor most of all watching the growth of a student, not only in the, in terms of their abilities, but in terms of their personality, uh, and in terms of them uh, of their own sense of self. And this, this has become a really part of, of the way I teach uh, is to is to to maximize uh, the, the the or, or to give the best uh, or enhance give the best journey enhance the journey for the student as best I can. Um, uh, so we so so we look at predominantly um, 15th century longsword, uh, the the uh, uniquely German weapon single-handed weapon known, known as the Messer, uh, literally in English, the knife, um, but it is a sword-like knife, uh, which is uh, about uh, 36 inches in length. Uh, but we also look at wrestling, we look at polex, um, the uh, pole weapon, so polex, spear, uh, and a variety, of other, a variety of other things, but predominantly we are a long sword and Messer school. Uh, I have a, before we go ahead and go to weapons, I'm going to ask you what you teach. Could you tell me one word? What do you prefer? Do you prefer HEMA or do you prefer the term Western martial arts or European martial arts? I actually prefer neither. Um, because the, the, there is a, the, the problem with both of them is how do we define Western? And also, how do we define European? Because when we're looking at, and this, this is, the, the, these, all of the useful throwaway catch-all titles that are largely understood within the community I work in, when we move outside that community, um, they can often be problematic. So this idea that um, uh, if we look at HEMA, for example, it's, it, it, it should be historical, European, and a martial art. The problem with the is with the European is where do we draw the boundaries of Europe? Because we've had so much cross traffic, um, not just over the last millennia, but after the, over the last few hundred years, 
Um, and so when we look at marginal or we look at um, border regions in Europe and growing up in a border region, I know exactly what this is like. If we look at border regions such as, for example, um, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, or any of the, any of the, the the furthest eastern European states, the influence of the Ottomans, for example, um, do we exclude or include Ottoman arts from this? Um, so the, the the terms themselves are, are 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 loaded by their very nature. I prefer the term historical fencing um, because historical fencing is just that. Um, fencing is not a great word to describe, for example, for example, the use of the spear. Um, but because what we do is predominantly with swords, I think historical fencing is m certainly my favorite term. Western martial arts, same problem. Where does the West end and the East begin? And there, and there is this crossover. There's this, po this is pollinated area. Um, okay. If you use fencing as a general term, why don't we use swordsmanship? Uh, Swordsmanship again is a, 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 linguistically um, swordsmanship that would that would possibly tie us purely to sword work, and because we're certainly in my school and many others out there, because we're working with many different disciplines that are related in terms of systems, uh, swordsmanship is perhaps I think too narrow. Um, historical combat is is an interesting is an interesting alternative. But I think again, it's the to uh, to try and to try to create a nomenclature for for this is it has proven quite difficult, um, and it, it, we're still if we think this to this year in September this year will be my twenty sixth year in in this field, um, and we still really can't decide what to call it, and I think because it's quite a young field. I mean, even comparatively, if we look at, for example, the emergence of uh, of, um, of of Chinese and Japanese martial arts in 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 the Western world, in in certainly in Europe and the United States, um, the phenomenon of the of the martial arts explosion of the nineteen sixties, you know, that still had, you know, almost twice the length of time to develop uh, an identity, and I find that. that the HEMA community is many communities, um, some good. Actually, I'll be fair, many good, some bad. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of my problems with the, in, in terms of the approach of the HEMA community uh, as at large. Um, but, but certainly the idea of, 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 of finding a suitable naming convention that captures everything. We find the same problem, for example, is do we describe combat sports? For example, is boxing historical European martial arts? Uh, there is an argument that says yes, it is, because we have boxing manuals dating from the, the, the 18th century. Uh, so if you're studying classical pugilism, say from the, the, the works of Daniel Mendoza, uh, you know, you are studying a hist an historic martial art. Um, and, and so, you know, th th there's all these questions that arise when we try to put terms on them. So I, I think, I, 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 I'll, me personally, I'd stick with historical fencing. Medieval fencing is really my niche. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. But there'll be a huge outcry of disagreement with everything I've said, I can guarantee it. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> everybody has their own idea about what, what it is. Uh, I mean, um, I, I don't, as you know, that uh, having been been exposed to HEMA community for a couple of years, and I only distanced myself from this community for the last two or three years. I went back to martial arts community where I come from, mm -hmm. but we will talk about it in the second part, why I did it. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, let's come back to the weapons and the weapon arts you uh, teach. Could you show us what you teach and explain the name to our viewers? So the, what everybody would be most familiar with, I would imagine, uh, who happens to come across the historical European martial arts community will be the longsword. And the longsword is just that. It is, a, in fact, I can't even fit it in the entire picture. Uh, this is uh, a typical late 15th century, early, uh, sorry, late, yeah, late 15th century, early 16th century longsword. Um, uh, typically a grip, about three hand spans, uh, pommel, 
quite a, a beautiful pommel on this one, uh, what's known as a, a, a scent stopper type pommel. Um, cross, and then a, a, large, a long, fairly slender tapering blade. Um, beautiful weapon um, in terms of the, the surviving methodologies we have. The handling of it is completely different to what most people who have who never picked one up would think. Uh, one common myth we find is that, or that we hear repeatedly, is that these are heavy. Um, this weapon, um, like all good, like any good tool, is designed to be fit for purpose. Uh, the balance on this is beautiful. I can pretty much balance it with two fingers, um, despite the fact that it weighs nearly 1.5 kilograms. Um, you would wouldn't expect it to weigh as much when you feel how it moves in the hand. Um, the grip normally is with the hands apart, although some early manuscripts do say to keep the hands together. Um, but uh, the manuscripts we work from uh, with the longsword are uh, in the German part of the Holy Roman Empire of the uh, early 15th century, the tradition of Johannes Lichtenauer. Uh, who we know very little about, but he left a legacy of masters behind him who recorded uh, Lichtenauer's methodology, often appended with their own uh, additional gloss. Um, so we have very, very good instructions on how to perform, uh, and not just how to perform the actions, but also the um, the fundamental principles of, of fighting alongside what we need to observe, how we need to conduct ourselves, um, the kind of ideal attributes that we need to embody when we fence either uh, in practice or earnestly against uh, against uh, an, an adversary. Um, and the, the long sword itself is a is a very interesting weapon in terms of how it uh, how it evolves uh, over the from the four, from the 15th into the 16th century uh, and the and, and the way that it actually um, begins to um, move away from being purely a weapon for the aristocratic classes to becoming a symbol of the new middle class um, and so by by the time we move into um, the 1500s we have organizations and find guilds arising in in certainly in 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 the in, in what we now call Germany, um, guilds arising where fencers will compete with other guilds in something known as the Fechtschule, uh, what literally means fencing school, but it's in fact not a school for teaching, but more of an organized competition uh, with very, very stringent rules and a very strict moral code about how one conducts oneself because the art of fencing becomes almost an... an uh, a symbol for uh, fit for the cultivation of a 15th century man um, or 16th, certainly with a long sword, 16th century. However, we see this happen earlier with the Messer, uh, and the Messer yeah. is uniquely German. And this is certainly my favorite thing to teach, and certainly my favorite subject within this within uh, within this field. Um, Messer is. Uh, a very uh, uh, essentially a machete, um, born from utilitarian everyday working knives um, of the 14th century. Uh, we then begin to see things happening, such as the length increasing. Um, this added line of defense at a right angle to the cross, uh, which forms um, a protection for the bare hand. First example of a complex hilt in Western European swords. Um, incredibly light. This one weighs 700 grams and is, sh is semi-sharp. Um, this is a is particularly um, um, a maneuverable piece. Very, very nice. Um, very broad blade, single cutting edge. Um, good strong point. Um, I have two questions for you. Why hmm. the grips of your sword are not covered in leather or in something like that? 